Welcome to Fossil Creek Tree Farm and Nursery. We're going to talk about trees today. Pretty broad subject, <clears throat> so we won't hit everything, but uh, we'll talk about some of the reasoning and, and some of the examples of the things you can use that are adapted here. Uh, I've got a few things to show, but we've got over eight acres, so obviously uh, we're not going to show that. And uh, I'll talk about a bunch of the things we have in inventory, so if you want to you know, come on down and look at them for yourself. That's typically the best way anyway. But um, we'll talk about, uh, first of all, to give you a, a start on trees. Uh, I did a little time in the, in the Air Force, and, you know, you have initials for everything, you know. So I tend to come up with those. And, when I'm, and it gives us some structure. So the first thing is S-O-F-F. -F. That's what we're talking about trees for because, and that stands for shade, ornament, food, and the last one, fragrance. Not a whole lot of them are that, but uh, typically it's the, that's the purpose of the trees in your landscape. Uh, of course, in North Texas, shade is not an option. Uh, if you don't have it, you tend to stay inside. So, uh, and ornament, of course, everybody wants you know, things out there that are fun to look at. And then food, we've got uh, a bunch of fruit trees we'll do here. Uh, I get questions all the time, like, can apples grow here or, you know, different things like that? Or can I grow uh, an orange tree or a lemon tree? Uh, of course, you can on those, but they're container plants. But we have apples that are adapted here, peaches, pears, plums, uh, pomegranates, figs, uh, a real broad assortment of uh, items that will produce food. And uh, some of them will do it almost right away, and then others take some years. Uh, and then fragrance, not that many things have that, but one of the neat examples, and it's kind of a slow-growing tree, but the Texas Mountain Laurel, uh, if you've been down to San Antonio around the river walk, they have big ones. They've been there forever. They grow slow, but when they bloom, uh, they don't smell like, they smell exactly like grape soda. I mean exactly like grape soda. Uh, and they're pretty too, but, uh, but slow. So here they're more of a, you typically they're planted as more of a specimen. Uh, with time, they can get big, but... Uh, if I planted one now, I'm not going to see it get big, but it would be worth it to have it uh, just for the uh, appearance and fragrance. Um, of course, for shade, typically it's hard to go wrong with uh, native trees uh, like red oak, live oak, bur oak, chinkapin oak. Um, they're adapted to our soil. Uh, because they've been here a lot longer than we have. So you don't have to amend the soil for them because uh, since they're native here, they've been growing in what we have for a long time. And what we have is typically, uh, you could call it heavy clay or this, that, or the other, or trash. You know, if you look at it, 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 it visually it looks very, when you dig a hole, it, it's not appealing in appearance, you know. You think, how can things grow in that? But uh, years ago, I planted uh, a red oak uh, from a 30-gallon in my daughter's yard, and it was the ugliest uh, dirt. Uh, I won't call it soil, calling it dirt, it's being generous. Uh, it was the ugliest stuff I've ever seen. Uh, clay that when it was wet, actually, when I dug the hole, and I got soil on my shovel. Oops, I slip and call it soil. Uh, I couldn't throw it off. I got it on the shovel, and then I had to move it to the side and step on top of the dirt and pull the shovel off of it. So that's, that's trash. And that thing took off growing like gangbusters from the get-go. Uh, never had a problem, and she was there for four or five years after I planted it. It grew into a, a neat looking tree and we didn't do anything. You know, I mulched the top of it and gave it, you know, a root stimulator, but we didn't, 
really do much of anything to get it to go and and it took off so uh, don't think of it as our soil won't grow anything I did it again call it soil uh, it will and uh, uh, so all those natives like that uh, are adapted and will grow fast they get to be sizable trees of the oaks like that I found that uh, red oaks grow the fastest uh, I, I had a squirrel plant one at my place. It's been a while, about 39 years, and went from an acorn to 60 feet tall and 60 feet wide. Of course, I've got pretty good dirt, and, uh, but it grew like gangbusters, and um, it's on the west side of my house, so uh, helps. Some. it's more than paid for itself in anything I've contributed toward it. Uh, because of the savings on my utility. Without it, um, my house will be marginal livable. Uh, live And it'll get 50 by 50 anyway. Uh, live oaks uh, don't grow quite as fast, and they typically are, they get to 35 or 40 feet tall, uh, tend to grow wider than, than tall. And uh, they're pretty much the only big evergreen tree we have. They do lose their leaves, but uh, the difference on them is they lose them in March. And as they're losing leaves, they're putting on their new leaves. So for two or three weeks, they look pretty thin. But by the time three weeks has gone by, they're back in full foliage. So if you were looking for a big screen uh, out on property, they would fit the bill. Um, uh, Burr oak. Is one of the largest growing oaks. It's got big leaves, and of course it's native. It's got deep, corky bark, so it's kind of neat looking even without the leaves. It has uh, the acorns about the size of golf balls, so they're kind of ornamental. And if a squirrel gets one of those, he's got he's got food for the day. Um, and uh, of course we also have a chinkapin oak, which is a different kind of a leaf, kind of an oval leaf with little lobes on the side, flaky bark once it gets older, uh, you know, a nice ornamental tree, and it'll get 50 by 50 also. So uh, they'll do a good job. And let's see. Uh, for, and we've got a bunch more shade trees, but we'll move on to ornament, uh, which is really helpful around suburban lots because a lot of times what you have is not much so uh, on the side over here we've got yopon holly and that one is a uh, another native so it's adapted to our soil and climate uh, and that one is uh, if you have a uh, the urge to uh, let your artistic side out it's come as some of these, and you can shape away on that if you want to do, you know, the the ones you've seen with balls all over it. Um, that one's an easy one to do, um, and you can and get creative. It's not required, uh, but it's easy to do and fun over time. Um, they will get, like I say, 15 feet plus wide and tall. Uh, a tough tree. They put on berries. Uh, that'll color up in November and it'd be ornamental through the winter and the ones we have around here that have berries uh, Seems like the the mockingbirds wait till February and then they start eating them pretty fast, but uh, good for um, wildlife and a neat looking tree and If you wanted to if you let it get you know taller and bushy the foliage will get real dense uh, you'd have a pretty decent chance of a mockingbird making a nest in that because the foliage will get so dense that uh, it tends to uh, hold out predators and so on and it's it's uh, they can hide their nest in there and next to it we've got a uh, vitex or chase tree and these guys grow fast you can see some of the blue blooms on them they bloom in the in the summer and Fairly, fairly rapid growth, and 
very tough, lose their leaves in the winter. And that's another one. This one, most of the ones we have are bushy from the ground up, which is the way they tend to grow, multiple trunks. This one has been kind of cleaned up to where it's got uh, three bare trunks. We also occasionally get them that have been trimmed to a single trunk, but uh, highly ornamental, very tough. The blooms have a little bit of fragrance. It's not strong, but there's a little bit there. And of course, the, uh, the leaves also have a, a fragrance. That's kind of you like it or you don't kind of thing. And then next to that, we've got a I can move this guy. Desert Willow. These just recently have uh, finished some of their bloom. Uh, this one is a variety called Bubba. I don't know where that came from, but I guess it fits in Texas. Uh, has a... Uh, Kind of a reddish purple bloom. The the native one that's not a named variety is more of a lavender white. Doesn't show up as much. These are highly ornamental, and uh, of course the bloom on things varies from year to year. This to me has been the year of the desert willow. There, I notice them all over town because it seems like all over town they're blooming profusely, much more so than average. So uh, I noticed them in places where I didn't even realize they were before because their, their bloom this year has been so profuse. This one's, uh, it can get over 20 feet and typically it's a multi-trunk. And of course you can kind of control that the way you would with a crepe myrtle. It's up to you as to how you shape it. And um, fairly rapid growth and adapted to uh, low water amounts and since it's a, a desert it's not really a willow they just call it that because of the shape of the leaf but uh, adapted to very high heat so uh, it's happy here and works with our works with our dirt and let's see and of course I didn't bring one up here but uh, crepe myrtle the quintessential ornamental tree uh, most of them, the bark is ornamental, and of course, all different colors of flowers. And uh, one thing that uh, people overlook, including myself, which I was reminded of this past winter, is most of the crepe myrtles have really uh, pretty fall color. So that's it's kind of like pretty blooms probably the longest bloom season of any uh, flowering shrub. Uh, a neat form, the trunks are a neat shape. Uh, as they get older, they tend to look, you know, they're not just round. They have shape, they tend to me, kind of look like muscles, you know. Uh, and uh, neat bark, neat flowers, fall color, uh, neat shape, and highly adapted here. Our soil is fine for them. They're very heat tolerant and cold tolerant. They do lose their leaves in the winter, but that just helps you observe the structure of the plant and the uh, uh, color of the bark. They have what's uh, uh, called an exfoliating bark. As the tree grows, uh, it's kind of like uh, you know crabs shed their. When a crab grows, he sheds his his ex exterior skeleton comes out and then it grows bigger and then it hardens. Well, as uh, crepe myrtles grow, their bark flakes off and that kind of reveals a different color and also is kind of a neat, a neat form. Um, I have had people call in and ask what's happening and what's wrong with their crepe myrtle. Um, it's what they do, uh, so not a problem. If, it's, if the bark is flaking off your crepe myrtle, that means it's growing, so things are good. Um, and, of course, uh, like I said at the beginning, trees a broad thing. So, as 
Some of them get huge and some not. Um, and this is a uh, smoke tree. It's going to get about 15 feet, but uh, highly ornamental. This variety here, he's kind of a purple. It's a royal purple. They also have neat fall color. And the, the smoke tree is when they do bloom, it's little bitty blooms, whole bunches of them, and it kind of looks like a cloud of smoke. So if you've ever seen uh, uh, the uh, pink muley grass, kind of the same thing. You know, a big puff of, of uh, blooms that looks like smoke. But, and it will lose its leaves in the winter. Uh, very tough as far as uh, the cola is concerned. Never going to be a problem with this one. And uh, not going to do much in the way of shade unless you're in exactly the right spot. But uh, as an ornamental, it's uh, really a neat thing. And of course, uh, this kind of purple, if you mix other colors with it, this kind of makes things pop. And let's see. And let's see. Of course, I, uh, we're just receiving now our fruit trees, so I don't have any here. But like I said, we, they all, they all uh, uh, work here. Uh, peach, plum, pear, apple, uh, a great assortment. And uh, so you can get significant food. We're getting in pecan trees, too, uh, and they work. Of course, the pecan trees we get are grafted. So uh, they will produce right away. Now, they won't produce a crop. Years ago, when I planted one at my mom's house, it was a grafted variety. And the first year, it produced one pecan. So they're ready to do it. Now, if you have a native pecan, you know, from the little pecan that came up in your yard, um, it's going to take forever. They're an okay, or they're an okay shade tree but it takes them decades to come into production. So uh, if you want pecans, uh, get a grafted variety uh, because the, uh, it's a rootstock, and then they have a cutting from a tree that's an old tree. So when they graft that onto that rootstock, that's the part that grows and produces. And since it's from an older tree, even though it's this tall, he thinks he's 40 or 50 years old. So that's why he'll produce right away. And those will be uh, pa paper shell types. They, get tall. they do. They get big. You know, figure on, depending on your soil, but 30, 40, 50 feet tall and wide. And let's see. And then, uh, okay. And now we'll talk about uh, placement, which is one of the key things about trees, um, especially since it's probably one of the things that's most frequently uh, done incorrectly. Uh, if you're uh, planting something, let's say it's a tree that's going to get 50 feet wide. Well, the way to think about it, that is then, is that if you're standing in the place where you're going to plant it, uh, you know, you're talking about a radius of from where you are 25 feet all the way around. It's going to be 50 feet across, but where you stand, that's going to make it, it'll reach out 25 feet. So bear that in mind. Um, and of course, we mentioned crepe myrtle. That's one of the most commonly misplaced plants in the state because we have so many varieties that and so many sizes uh, we have some dwarf ones here that get two feet by two feet they have a very tiny leaf so it's hard to misplace that it's only going to get two feet wide but you can buy uh, crepe myrtles uh, like a natchez which blooms white has gorgeous bark but It'll get 25 or 30 feet tall. Probably someplace you can get that in a three-gallon container. You might even get a one-gallon container. So 
when it's this tall. Where do you place that? Well, it's only this tall, so it probably shouldn't go too far from the house. Well, that's the main mistake because in no time at all, that two or three foot plant, that's a good thing about crepe myrtles, they grow relatively fast, which is good if they're uh, a good placement. But if you plant a large variety close to your house, uh, it's gonna outgrow the location uh, in a few years, you're going to realize, wow, that's out of place. It's too close to the house. By then, it's big. So moving it is really difficult. So that's the key thing is uh, realize how big the item's going to get. And if it were a uh, big tree and you've got a, a one-story house, even if it was something like a red oak or whatever, uh, if, if you had a one-story house, you could go... 15 to 20 feet from your house and plant it. If it was a two-story house, if you're doing a red oak, then I'd probably want it to be 20 to 25 feet so that it's got, it's got the room. The reason being a, a one-story house, it can grow over the top, so you can be a little closer. But if it, typically, if you're planting it far enough away for the limbs to be uh, a good distance, then you don't have to worry about the uh, roots bothering your foundation. Most of our foundation problems are caused by uh, uh, the soil moisture fluctuating. You know, when clay gets dry, it shrinks, and when it gets wet, it expands. So that's a lot of force exerted on a foundation. If the foundation is up to it, you're good, but keeping a uh, relatively moist soil uh, not wet, but, you know, not going bone dry and then wet and bone dry. You know, a stable moisture situation around your house is going to be the best uh, safeguard for your foundation. And let's see. Is that even pretty small? Small things are not going to bother. No, but I mean, keeping them moist to go, like, around your house right. is enough to help keep it. Right. Yeah. 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 If your if your landscape is happy around the house, then your house is good. And of course, what that is is uh, the landscape. It requires moderate moisture levels. You know, you don't want it getting really dry, but then you don't want it really wet because around here with the clay soil, if it stays really wet, you're going to have plant problems. Uh, and then, um, and of course, I do get this question. People ask, you know, uh, it's going to be in full sun. I don't have anything. Well, you're safe there. Pretty much everything is full sun. If it's a tree, the exception would be uh, dwarf Japanese maple. They're an understory tree. So morning sun is great, uh, midday and afternoon sun, they will scorch. They might live through it. They're gonna look like they wanna die. So they're a understory tree, the intensity of the sun. And of course that around here too, uh, that shows up typically in July, August and early September because they're kind of different. You know, up through typically through the middle or maybe even the end of June, full sun's not too terribly intense. But when we hit July, that's when the inferno shows up. So plants that have made it without leaf scorch or sunburn, um, if they're not adapted to really full sun, that's when you'll see that showing up. It's, it's, it's just too intense. There's a, there's a lot of difference um, between 93 and 103. So, and and the plants will tell you there is. And let's see. And of course, uh, I mentioned a little bit about the uh, live oak as far as uh, screen. Uh, this guy here, uh, eastern red cedar, it's native. It'll get you know 40 feet plus to about 35 or 40 feet wide. Um, so it's it's not for a suburban area, but if you've got a uh, some space out in the country and you want a 
windbreak slash screen uh, to black out a, a view that you don't want to have. This is the item. Um, pretty decent growth rate and uh, tough as nails. Uh, and we'll get, you're not going to see through it. Uh, and it will grow wide from the ground up. So probably the preeminent uh, screen item that we have uh, in Texas. And when you drive around out, this is what you see in the fields. So it's out there already. It will help, you know, when it gets big, you know. And of course, the uh, wind breaks are that. Wind breaks are wind breaks. They're not wind blocks. They'll tone it down, but, you know, and of course, in that regard, too, uh, a live oak makes a really good uh, uh, windbreak because it keeps its foliage and uh, it tends to grow uh, not as tall as a lot of the other oaks, but wider. You know, if it, if you, uh, you know, if one was been there a while and it was 40 feet tall, uh, if it hadn't been uh, pruned and kept in, it might very well be 65 feet wide. There are old ones, which just for fun, we're not gonna we're not gonna have them in our yard. But there are old ones around that are 40 feet tall and 100 feet wide, and those are probably 250 to 300 years old, and the trunks like that. And they just, I, I saw a group of them and I thought, wait a minute, that limb is to that tree and it, it goes from there to there. And it's like, that's, that's a hundred feet. I mean, huge. So, uh, but before 300 years, they're going to grow there, we don't have to worry about that, but before that, they're going to grow wider than tall. So, uh, what about uh, well, anything will slow it down a little bit, but I would say that, um, not a not particularly effective for windbreak and for shade. That varies among the fruit trees uh, with the way they grow. Now, peach trees, uh, they grow quick, but you're shooting for, if you've driven out west or you, you've driven up toward Wichita Falls and you see the peach orchards, they're about 10 feet tall and they're shaped like that. You know, they've been trimmed for a vase shape and they're 10 or 12 feet tall and makes it easy to harvest the fruit, opens up the center of the tree and also uh, peaches, you're going to be trimming off 25 to 40% of the tree every year. So it also makes it easier for uh, the tree to be trimmed. Versus something like a pear tree, very little pruning involved and um, lives quite a long time. You, there are uh, home sites where the home is no longer there, you know, there's a foundation and there'll be pear trees. There won't be peach trees. <laughs> there'll be pear trees. Cause they, they're, so with those fruits, one tree or two trees to get them to really produce fruit? Uh, with peaches, uh, and we have pretty much, um, most of the trees we have, uh, there are some varieties that are self fruitful and some that aren't. But on peach trees, they're all self-fruitful. You can plant one peach tree, you're going to have peaches. Uh, and we've got plums like uh, Methley, Santa Rosa. Uh, they're self-fruitful. If you're going to plant two plum trees, you know, one of them ought to be Methley because it's self-fruitful and it's a great pollinator of other plum trees. Um, uh, Methley. Uh-huh. And, let's see. and, of course, you know, pomegranates are self-fruitful. Um, persimmon, uh, we typically have fuyu. That one's self-fruitful. 
And of course, the um, citrus, all the citrus trees are uh, self fruitful. Uh, Do they grow up? Do they grow up? In a container here. You have to, because our winter, uh, you're typically, they'll, we'll have some weather that they're not going to, you know, it wouldn't necessarily kill them, but it would damage them uh, pretty bad, or we do uh, frequently have weather that would actually kill them. So they're a container only thing. Uh, pecan trees, it's uh, best to have two varieties. Uh, and the ones that we typically have that are good for around here are um, uh, Desirable and Choctaw. And the difference being one of them has male pollen first and the other one has female pollen first. And those are the two kind of categories of pecan trees. So you typically best to have one from each. And that's what those are. So they do a good job of pollinating each other and they're adapted to this area. And of course, uh, pecan trees are not um, uh, pollinated by bugs, bees, and such. It's by wind. So, um, yeah. And so, and we have plenty of that. So, uh, and let's see. Uh, apple trees, you know, it's typically two varieties is good on that. And, uh, Pear trees, you know, that's another one where you're going to have uh, better crops if you have two varieties. Okay. And of course, we mentioned a bunch of the positives and a lot of that, like appearance and all, that's in the eye of the beholder. You know, and one thing I hear about uh, from customers is um, about the negatives, you know, the litter that trees produce. I guess that's a negative. And uh, my response, I don't really say it, but uh, is kind of like, oh, the humanity. <laughs> you know, if, if that's the worst we have happening to us is some of the litter from a tree, Man, things are going pretty well, you know, if that's all we have to worry about. And, of course, if, uh, and that could be a positive, too. Uh, oak leaves, for instance, they're a great contribution to the compost pile. So if you don't have one, get one of those started. And um, your plants will appreciate it in your garden. So um, they're, they're contributors. Uh, of course, the other thing, too, is uh, I've already mentioned savings on the utility, and the placement for that is on your big trees. You want them uh, west or and or south of your house because uh, that will help cope with the sun heating of your, your house. And one thing that I've noticed, that's where mine are, my big ones at home. And one, things that I, one of the things that I noted uh, after living there a while um, so if you're not quick on the uptake, if you live someplace for decades, then it begins to dawn on you some of the things that are happening. But uh, the ones I have to the west and southwest of my house are red oaks. And when it's really hot, they're protecting my house. But then come uh, December and things aren't so hot and the sun goes from overhead to low in the south, they lose their leaves. And about that time, the days are shorter, and it's cool. And in the evenings or afternoons, I appreciate the light. You know, they let the light in. The days are shorter. It gets dark sooner, but they let in the light. So it brightens up the place. And the alternative is, if instead of a red oak, I had a live oak in that position. Uh, here's, what's, here's what happens. You know, when it's hot, that's fine. But then when we go into the late fall and winter and the sun goes from there to there, anything that's on the north side of a live oak is in cold storage because the sun will never hit it. 
all, some, all winter long, the sun is low, and with an evergreen tree, it might shine under the, the southern part of it, but anything to the north edge and to the north of that tree is in an all-day shadow every day. So if you want to store something and keep it cool, that's a place for it. But if that's your patio, uh, it may be a non-starter because in the winter, you know, you, you want the deciduous thing that lets the light and heat in uh, to that area. And let's see. And, uh, of course, the other thing that they contribute, it's a significant boost to your property value. When somebody comes up, and we've all shot for a house, if you come up and it's a bare yard, <laughs> it's an immediate turnoff because it's like, well, this is a griddle, you know, it's going to be full sun, it's going to heat the house, it's going to heat all the windows. Uh, when it's hot, you're not going to be able to go outside until nearly evening because, you know, it's a frying pan. So, but if you go up to something, uh, a house, and it's got uh, big trees for shade and or crepe myrtles and pretty things like that around a patio, uh, you, it's an immediate, you're drawn to it. Uh, of course, that's a, uh, of course, not even just shading your house like in the side or backyard, but of course I say that because my house faces north, which is a good thing. My backyard is in the south, so all winter long, it's in the sun. So it's warm and it's bright. On the north side of the house, it's chilly. So, And if the wind's blowing from the north here in the winter, but it's sunny, if you've got the house and other things blocking the north, I can go out my front door and think, ooh, this is not an outside day. But then I go out the south, you know, the back door of my house, and it's like, whoa, this is nice. I can do this. It's, it's that much different. You know, it's like, okay, let's be out here versus, nope. You know, what's on TV when you go out the north? So, uh, and of course, uh, what I was going to say, as apart from, you know, shading the house, too, uh, in the front yard, uh, one of the, you know, that's, if you don't have anything out there, that's all public space. Because when you step onto your front porch, there it is. Anybody driving by, there's the street, you know. There's no, there's no buffer. Whereas, see, my house is 60 feet back from the street. But you don't have to be that far back. But I've got trees out there some and when you have those it psychologically if you go out 20 feet or 30 feet from your house so you just have an ornamental crepe myrtle or a yopon or something like that or off to the side you have a bigger tree and off to this side you have a bigger tree when you get out of your car in the driveway and you walk past that tree toward your house, psychologically, you've just entered your private space. It's not a fence. It's not completely visually blocked, but it's not quite a public space. You know, you've got something out there, and you have entered your space. From those trees or shrubs or whatever out, that's still the public space. But once you get past them, then you already get the feeling of, and your guests will get the feeling of, you're being welcomed. You've come into a uh, home space. You're no longer in a public space. So that's some of the things that you can consider when you're doing uh, placement. And uh, of course, also as far as placement is concerned, if, uh, being a person of somewhat limited imagination, uh, there are people that can, you know, they can visualize things extremely well. 
well, I'm not necessarily that person, and there are other people like me. So one of the things that you can do is, if you're trying to think about a placement of a tree, um, if you have a patio umbrella, it's pretty big. I've got one, it's like nine feet across, and you know, it's like nine feet tall, and it's got a heavy, heavy uh, base to it that's made out of marble. And I tend to walk like this when I'm carrying it, but you can put that out, and think, I'm thinking about putting the tree right here. You put that big umbrella there, fold it out, and then you don't have to conjure up everything in your brain. Obviously, that umbrella is not a big tree, but it helps you to visualize, you know, something there. Of course, the, um, the other thing that you want to look at as far as placement is, and I've done that kind of thing, and um, I walk my different, I walk in from the driveway and see what it looks like. You know, I look out the kitchen window or you can look out the living room window because that's one of the things. If you have ornamental things, you don't want to just see them from outside. If it's gorgeous uh, and you have picture windows, it's like, well, when I'm out here on the patio, it looks really good there, I guess. But then if you put the umbrella there and then you walk into your living room and look out the picture window and it's like, well, it doesn't work from here and I want it to. So you can alter it according to which views you want it to uh, uh, function in. So uh, a lot of times uh, when you're dealing with a blank slate, it's kind of like, that's like being the first person to do something. You know, if you're the second, you get to, you get to benefit from the first guy's experience. You know, so that's much easier. But if it's a blank slate, it's like, where would you put a tree, you know? So, you know, when you're dealing with, uh, you take into consideration uh, shade, utilities, the patio, uh, uh, visually screening, uh, a bad view, uh, or if it's an ornamental thing, if it's ornamental, you want to look at it, you know? So where are my, where do I, you know, I sit on my patio when I want to see things, or I sit in my living room, or I have a picture window in my bedroom, and I want to be able to see something out of there. Well, those, those are the things that you uh, keep in mind for placement. Let's see. And I guess that... That's a good question. I mean, do you need, like, if the canopy's eventually go to 30 feet, or you want to keep it within 20 feet by putting it, so do you have, looking at not trunks, but canopies, right. do you allow two feet around each tree? That, that's, a per, that's like the eye of the beholder, what you're shooting for. If you, you keep that in mind, if, you want, as the trees grow, if you've got the space and you want it to be a tree with some space and a tree, 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 with space around them, you're going to keep in mind, if it's a red oak or whatever, you know, it's going to do 50 feet. You know, so that's where you get back to the, I'm standing right here, 25 feet. Um, so that's a kind of a I, the beholder, judgment call on what you want the appearance to be. But the, uh, the other side of that is um, that if they're planted closer and they grow somewhat together, that's not harmful to the tree. It will ultimately, it would limit its size somewhat, but it's not going to hurt the tree. Okay. Does it, if you're planting closer, doesn't that usually tend to push the tree up? Right. And, and do away with the canopy. Right. So well, it gets towards the top. yeah, yeah. It, it won't really n limit much in the way how much it goes up. It'll just limit 
how much it goes out. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, as, as things grow together and kind of shade things, some of the lower limbs kind of, they will depart in time. And, of course, even, even if they're not planted too close, that tends to happen with trees. The lower, some of the lower limbs are going to fade out because they're not getting any sun. You know, the growth of the tree is growing up, so uh, uh, limbs and leaves are not permanent. They, they serve their time, and as they get bigger and, and uh, the branches get bigger, the center of the tree is going to kind of open up because the canopy of leaves shades that out, you know, to a, a significant degree. So that's kind of a, a choice of how you want it to appear. Sure. You mentioned about crepe myrtles and making it bigger. The builder of our house planted an ornamental crepe myrtle, and in one year, I mean, I tuned it back a lot. Right. This guy's blooming and happy and, yeah. and going, this canopy is going to grow out, outgrow the space. Right. Is it, is it, should we move it? Because I know it's just going to get. Right. And it's right at the foundation of our house. Yeah. Can you sure. They no. The uh, winter time, you know, uh, best for that uh, when it's dormant and it's cool, uh, because the uh, uh, you transplant it and the soil stays warm, so you won't see much going on with the top, but the roots will start to uh, reestablish. You know, get as a good size root ball if you can, and. Um, uh, you know, that'll work, but uh, that's one of those time is of the essence. You know, you can't say, oh, I'll do that next year because then it's like, uh-oh. It can get to the point where, and a lot of them do this, it's too too long, too late, and it's too big and it's too close to the house and there's no way to do it without, uh, you're going to damage it, you know, by, by that. But uh, in fact... Uh, one of my uh, big red oaks that I have at my house, uh, it came up under the eave of my house. Squirrels aren't too good on placement. Um, and it had three trunks, so it was really, had a neat appearance. But it got up to 10 feet and under the eave of my house. And I would have just jerked it out of there, except it had three trunks. It was really pretty. So I balled it, and my neighbor helped me pull it to the front toward the street, and I replanted it, and I did that in the winter, and it just took off that spring uh, growing like gangbusters, and now it's 50 feet tall and 50 feet wide. So you can do that on the Yeah. Yeah. What about mesquite? I think we actually have some. It's the first time I've... I've seen some in a container, but they're they're uh, tough trees. Um, they're 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 thin shade, you know, because you know they're not that dense of foliage, but they're very tough. And of course, uh, the native ones, you know, they have on the foliage they have thorns, yeah. so. Um, I think we have a few here, but they're they're thornless. But they're typically uh, uh, they're kind of a wild thing and have a, a deep root, so uh, transplanting them is pretty iffy. And they so, spread by themselves, right? Yeah, the beans, you know, out out in the wild. But uh, uh, I've I've got a, an old one at the back of my yard that I haven't had the heart to completely take out now and and uh, but they're kind of ornament, ornament ornamental in the way but uh, you don't see them much available in the trade uh, to be planted a lot of places they'll pay you to come get them yeah. <laughs> for, for firewood yeah uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think that about covers it. Thanks for tuning in.